yeah, I'm absolutely honored and thrilled to be in the company today um, of an amazing speaker who has not only kept her finger on the pulse um, in this in this digital space, but she's really led the charge. Um, I think, you know, for me, I'm I'm particularly passionate about women doing great things. I love the girl power. And so today, it's a great um, thrill to be around a woman that has done some marvelous things. Um, I just want to read to you a little bit about our speaker, Bertha Kak. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Bertha. Um, so Bertha um, has studied chemical engineering at UCT. She's done her honors, her honors in process design, and she holds an MBA degree as well. She spent 15 years um, in the corporate world where she's worked as an engineer, a project manager, and performance manager. And she became an entrepreneur in 2017. So Bertha has started um, a software development company. I know that she's actually founded a number of companies across the software development space and also the le online learning space. Um, and I think the two, the, the, the two together are quite uh, powerful. And so she's started Tati Software Development Company um, for to develop software for corporate clients, which include I am an entrepreneur. Uh, Telcom, Mining Investment Corporation, Sunlam, and Sandbox. She also does tech consulting with SMEs, where she provides them with software development services um, that include uh, a setup of MVP and proof of concept. In addition to this, she's also developed software called Scoco, and of course, um, what she will be sharing a lot about today absolutely amazing um, mobile GPT. And so welcome, Bertha. Um, if you will turn on your camera, allow us to see you and yeah, just introduce yourself. Tell us what life is like in your world. Um, yeah, what what is what does the journey look like for you day to day in your space? Good afternoon and thank you very much for the introduction. I've turned the camera on. I'm not sure if you can see me. It hasn't come up yet, uh, Bertha. We'll maybe just give it a minute or so. Let me turn off and on some of this tech stuff. Um, I think we had the same issue earlier on. But anyway, to save time, I'll continue and then we'll see if the camera comes back on. I've turned it on on my side. So I'll just start by, thank you very much for that uh, very detailed introduction. I think you've pretty much covered everything about uh, who I am. I am a mostly 80% of my time is spent just doing software development for clients. And then I think the other 20% is developing my own software, which is a very, which you already mentioned um, as Coco and uh, Mobile GPT, which I will be talking to today um, based on the technology of Chat GPT, which I think a lot of people are interested in learning more about. Yentol, uh, you on mute. Thank you, Anissa. So uh, as I was saying, Bertha, I use um, the desktop version of ChatGPT like a couple of times a day. I think it is magnificent. Um, I would like to hear from you um, what you think the value of the mobile uh, GPT is and, and you know its existence and its development. What value do you think it will bring um, for us? Bertha, I'm just checking if you're still there. Uh, she's, she's on mute. She's also got on mute, yeah. We might have lost her now. Hello? Ah, there we are, Bertha, you back? Yeah. Yes, I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, I missed the last question. You said you were using the uh, uh, the version, the desktop version yes, of chat. So yeah, so I use it. So it's it's become like, you know, a frequent friend of mine now. Um, I just wanted to hear from from you, you know, what you feel the value of mobile GPT is, you know, it's it, its existence, its development, what value will it bring for us? OK, I think personally, there is a lot of value to be gained from mobile GPT and chat GPT, the desktop version, whichever one works for you. 
when I first was introduced to the GPT and OpenAI, it was mostly from a generative text point of view. So the first value for me was just the ability to be able to generate text very, very quickly. I used it at the time for you know content development, but I think it has moved beyond that to, to, to what it is today. And I think one of the biggest value today is um, the ability to get access to uh, trillions of megabytes of data, of information, all the information that's available that has been used to train uh, chat GPT, you can access it in almost a moment's instant. So think about when you're trying to do research or you're trying to work on a project and you're trying to get information, you can almost get it at your fingertips. And taking it further from a desktop point of view now to a mobile, where now you can access it on WhatsApp, um, then I think then the accessibility of it then is even expanded because now it's not just a matter of everybody that has a desktop or a computer, it's now just anyone who has a phone that has a WhatsApp on it, you know. So I think we're saying we can now bring information into the hands of people, access to information. So imagine your biggest library um, source of information now is just on WhatsApp. You can just pretty much ask it anything that you want. I think that's one of the biggest values for me. I also feel um, maybe Bertha, it's also, am I lagging a little bit? Is my internet okay? It's yes. okay. Good. So, um, yeah, I also feel like, you know, this whole thing where, where GPT is like so removed, it feels a little bit removed almost from people at this stage. We're like, you'll speak to someone and they have never used GPT before. And potentially yeah. it is because it, it is a little bit distant from you now. And so I, I suppose the mobile version, as you as you beautifully expressed, that it just becomes so much more accessible um, to, to users who are currently using, I mean, all of us use WhatsApp. And so I'd be interested to know, just like from a development um, perspective, you know, like how long has it taken to develop this platform A, and then B also just like your journey into the development space. I, I, I don't know, I'm not very like um, certain on this, but I, would imagine like um, yeah I don't know if, if it's if it's a really populated industry for women um, but mm -hmm. I'd be really interested to know your your sort of journey into the development space and also specifically how long it's taken to develop um, mobile GPT. Okay, um, I uh, as as we mentioned in my bio studied. Uh, process engineering, uh, chemical engineering specifically. So I was not a developer. I didn't you know, study computer science at school. I was an engineer for 15 years. And so my journey started in 2017 when I started my own software development company. At the time, um, what I loved about software development, and I think what makes it accessible for youth, for young people, for women, is the fact that there is so much information and data out there available that can actually enable almost anybody to self educate and teach yourself. So I'm a self-taught developer. I learned a lot of what I know from YouTube videos, from you know online learning platforms, from a lot of uh, code that exists online that somebody else put on GitHub, for example. So all these different places, I had the time because I quit my job. So I gave myself just full time to take and learn, you know, and um, as a result, I started to develop, you know, mobile applications, website applications, and over time, I started to build this reputation and this sort of portfolio of clients, which has grown, you know, uh, to what it is today. From what you've already mentioned, with my with the kind of kind of client base that I already have as a business, mobile GPT itself was actually an interesting journey because. I had been following the entire AI and the generative space for a couple of years. You know, this thing started in 2018 already. 2018, OpenAI was well, the first time they released uh, GPT-1 at the time. And I think the year later, they did GPT-2, GPT-3. So I've sort of been interested in this and trying to figure out how can this tool actually be used to develop an application that is going to be useful for people. So it was only last year in 2022 when they finally released um, chat GPT that I thought to myself, well, actually, um, this chat GPT is something that can be taken and be sort of developed into a different application that can sit in somebody else's mobile that can now bring chat GPT into the mobile space. So it took a couple of a month, I think a month, a month and a half, but mostly because I already had a lot of the experience in uh, software development. And last year, one of my platforms, which is Coco, we spent a lot of time working on the WhatsApp API. 
So the WhatsApp API is the one which we actually use on mobile GPT to bring ChatGPT to you. So we combine the OpenAI ChatGPT API with the WhatsApp API in a product, which is one of the things that actually hasn't been done by a lot of people. When we did it, we were one of the first applications to do it globally. There's a lot of applications now that do what we do, but when we did it, it hadn't been done before. So we took that open AI API and we said, well, we've got the WhatsApp API here. Can we combine this and put it in an application and bring WhatsApp, I mean, bring a chat GPT to WhatsApp? This is, this is amazing. And it is absolutely, I think, where the world is moving to. I think the fact that, you know, we now have all of the this information, access to information resources just about everywhere to teach you, to train you, to do something by yourself. Um, I think about just a few weeks back, I was trying to figure out how to do a video. I could just go and and, and learn right there. And so I think, do we still have you, Bertha? Yes, yes, I'm still Okay, yeah. good. Um, yeah, and so I think I think exactly your journey that you've described is exactly actually what this tool um, can empower people essentially to be able to do as well. And so Bertha, just just you know, having listened to this, I'd be interested to know what are some of the challenges and, and roadblocks that you may have experienced along the way. Um, one of the biggest one, and if you heard one of my interviews before, you would you would know this one. Um, being a black woman in technology in itself is a challenge. I think a lot of people think that we are advantaged as black women, mostly because they think we have opportunities. We can just get into certain programs because we are black women. But actually, being a black woman is one of the biggest disadvantages you can have going into engineering, first of all, or even the tech space, because nobody expects you to do something to the point where you become an outlier. So if you understand statistics where you have a cluster of things and then you've got outliers and funny enough that's actually how ai models work they look at uh, previous uh, sort of themes and how things work and things that don't fit into specific models so i was actually a victim of i think our classification models because when i first created a mobile gpt i've mentioned this many times everybody knows this i personally was blocked online my personal accounts on google on linkedin on on Twitter, on, I mean, almost everything you can think of because they thought, well, this can't be real, this must be a scam. How can, you know, the sort of, if you're a black woman from South Africa and you're trying to create a Google ad, they expect you to be creating an ad that's selling nail polish or hair products and you don't have any issues. And suddenly you're creating an app that is an AI chat GPT on WhatsApp and everyone is thinking, well, this is a scam. So I was actually blocked. It took me like a couple of days to, you know, to try to submit my personal information and prove to Google and prove to LinkedIn that actually I'm not a scam. This is a real application. It works. And obviously we went through all the steps. But what I learned was obviously I didn't even know that these controls were in place, but it's a challenge. And I think a lot of black and youth people are going to experience it. It's that class ceiling you don't know is there until you hit it, is that you're not expected to do certain things. And if you do it, the, uh, the classification models are going to pick you out as a scam or an, an outlier because you don't fit into the model, into the system of, of, of what certain people, what they're supposed to do. And I think as a country, and I'm glad that I'm talking to the office of the premier, hopefully there's somebody that's listening that can take this on. I think as a country, we need to start thinking around how do we build our own um, high level Google, our own LinkedIn, our own platforms that are going to be looking at black businesses and black engineers and young and youth developing because every if you want to build a tech business you must go through google google must allow you to advertise and they're going to decide how much you must pay per click and all of those things that means google has the power to decide whether you're going to make it or not make it as a business even after all of that uh, the processes I went through to prove who I am and I, I showed them this is not a scam, this is a real business. Even today, Google doesn't allow me to advertise mobile GPT on their platform, which is quite weird, which tells me that um, there could be many innovations out there that is just being, you that you'll never see about, you'll never hear about because it's just getting blocked by the tech businesses. Why are we not developing our own tech businesses that will promote our own innovations in South Africa. Because if I hit this glass ceiling, how many other innovators out there are innovating but will never be seen because they will never be able to put their, their products on Google or any other big platform, which is where you need to be to grow as a business. Wow, I think, 
Anissa has said here, um, perseverance in action. I, as you were speaking, I, I was reminded of this um, this clip I've seen on, I've recently gone into this whole TikTok, uh, TikTok rabbit hole. So I see all of these encouraging and inspirational posts where legit woman, Oprah Winfrey would say, this is how many times I was told no. And, you know, just that level of perseverance, I have to acknowledge you woman to woman. Um, but also, I think for the next question, I have to acknowledge you because um, I was going to ask you, you know, how does mobile GPT impact and improve the lives of youth? Um, but we also have to remember that our youth are from this, uh, the same streets, the same demographic um, and, and potentially struggles um, that you may have faced along your journey. And so, yeah, if you'll just take us through, um, Bertha, what you think some of so, the, the ways they'll, the G mobile GPT will improve um, their lives. Yeah, so I'll start with a disclaimer here because uh, mobile GPT, one of the biggest criticisms around it is the fact that it's a paid service and that it's not free. So people would say to me, but how will you actually help the youth that's poor sitting in the villages if people have to pay for it? Unfortunately, I cannot get around that because even the WhatsApp API charges me for each and every single WhatsApp message that gets sent out. So if I provided it for free, it would mean I'm paying for it from my own pocket. So they, there's a cost involved in building these platforms and somehow somebody has to pay for it. However, I think the real benefit is going with the schools and the education system and thinking around how maybe to provide the service to people and have maybe a person sponsor it or somebody who has the money to be able to allow for this service to be brought to the people. Because number one, I grew up in a village school. I actually went to Wanamala High School in Limpopo where we had nine classrooms in the entire school and half of the time maybe we were learning under a tree. We didn't have a library. We didn't have anything else, but we were still expected to write the same exam paper at the end of the year that's being written by anybody going to a Model C school that has 100 libraries and tutors and everything. And you know, half of the people would fail and people would think that we're failing because we are stupid, we're just not smart enough. But to be honest, by the end of the year when I was writing my exam, I had only covered a half of the syllabus based on the availability of the teachers and everything we went through. So if I've only learned half the syllabus, how am I going to pass at the end of the year? So imagine now um, you have this tool in a, in a, in a student's pocket uh, who can now ask it anything, you know? So um, if the teacher hasn't covered this part of the syllabus, I could just ask mobile GPT and it will give me the answers because it also has uh, access to actual knowledge information that um, that is being taught at schools. And you can also customize it if you wanted. You could customize it and put the entire school curriculum into it if you wanted. There's a way that that can be done. And then imagine you now have a tutor and a teacher in a kid's pocket. Kids that don't have libraries at school that cannot go and go and read Romeo and Juliet book physically from the library could just maybe interact with it through an AI system that is available on a mobile device. So I think personally, if we thought around how to use the technology. It is a useful thing for learning and it can be used for places where resources are hard. Is it easier to build a library with 100 books or could you just give guys a, uh, an AI database in their mobile device and then they could access a million books or all the trillions of data that's been on the internet since the beginning? So it's something to think about in that sense. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Bertha. I think, you know, the next thing left for you to do is to show us, you know, I see some comments here, people saying, woman, la, well done. We love the story. We love the vibes. We want to see the vibes, my friend. Can you show us um, a demo? Can I see this platform? How do we use it? Where do we go? Yes. So I'm going to try and share my screen over here. I'm going to share my entire screen. And you just let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see what I'm sharing? Yes, yes. you can. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, I'm, I've got a WhatsApp window and I've got my notes over here because I'm uh, so I don't forget to demo different parts of the application. That's why you're seeing the notes. So this is the application. It's a WhatsApp application. So as opposed to an app which somebody has to download, this is very, very simple. All you need is a WhatsApp phone number and the WhatsApp phone number that you can use to access the application is um, 076. 734-6284, uh, and I will also put it 
later on in the chat and you can access it later on. And then you have a conversation like a typical chat conversation. So over here, let me just push this window up so you can see everything that I'm typing. So let's say I wanted to type, you know, um, I could ask it a question. I've got some things that I've typed in here, like, you know, do you know, what can you tell me about Sun Tzu? So Sun Tzu is one of those, uh, is, is, is one of the Chinese um, uh, authors that I think authored the art of war. Imagine you had an assignment and you had to develop something about Santu. The time it would take you to go and read about it, and now you can just ask it. You have like a conversation, and then it will just respond. Santu was a Chinese general, military strategist, and it will give you the information that is available on this person. So on 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 whatever the question that you ask it. So you can think of it like a chatbot. I've asked it everything from tell me a bedtime story to very very high level so if you think about a school in a school maybe as photosynthesis it's a very uh, it's a typical subject that kids at schools are learning about all the time my daughter who is in high school learns about this topic is one of the things she actually asks chat gpt let's say you're doing a, a school project and you just wanted to learn about this instead of going into the books and trying to find which chapter of the biology book is talking about photosynthesis, you could just ask it to please describe the process of photosynthesis for me, and it will go and answer it. And you can see the timing that it takes. It's just a matter of say, it's just a few seconds, less than a minute that it takes to answer you with everything that you want. And so, um, so thinking about it as access to information, this is where it goes, but it's not limited to just being a chatbot. Um, this is what it's mostly used for. It can also do maths. You know, it can do very, very high level maths, which is something I was very happy to find out. So let's say I do this. I use this myself personally. I'm in a restaurant. I'm about to leave and I've got a bill with four people and I'm asking it, OK, fine. If we have to pay 10 percent tip on this bill and there is four of us, how much must each person pay? So here it will do the calculations for you. And what I like is that it's actually even describing how it did the calculation so that you can understand how to get to the answer. So this is where maths come in. So if you've got those maths problems, you could just type it in and it will even show you, okay, well, if you want to add a 10% tip, then it will be that much. And then this is the total. And then you're going to divide it by three people because there's three of you and each one of you will pay this much. So think about those kind of maths problems. It can answer this. Um, it can do currency conversions when I was traveling and I'm paying in certain currency and I've got South African rands, and I want to know, well, how much is this in South African rands? You can just ask it, and it does very, very high level quality maths for you. So this is just the chat functionality. And um, the last part, which is something most people don't know, because I don't see a lot of people using this, is chat GPT can also write code. It can do coding. So if you think about learning how to code, because you, I, I had a question earlier on about you know learning how to code, uh, you can ask ChatGPT to help you with coding. It is capable of, of most of the coding languages. So here I'm asking it, I'm a Django developer, and can you write me a typical Django code for a model that can extend the user model containing profile image and value? So you can just describe for to it exactly what you want it to do for you. So here I specifically asked it to write me code. And what you can see over here, this is code. If you understand Python, this is Python code. So it's it's going to write the code for me. You're going to use this model and this is what the code looks like. And then and then at the bottom here, if you are learning coding, it's explaining to you exactly what it's doing. Here we're extending that and then this does that and then this means that. And then so you can see how in a learning environment, this is very, very, very useful. I'm a professional coder and I code all the time, but I actually use this chat GPT almost every other day just to go through my old code to make sure that I've, wrote, I've written it properly because maybe my coding could be improved, it could be more efficient. So sometimes I just paste my whole code in here and then ChatGPT will rewrite it for me, even though the code works, but it will just optimize it nicely because it's using AI to do that. And actually there was a story in the news where the Samsung engineers were actually putting the Samsung code into ChatGPT and it was like a whole, um, uh, you know, long story that eventually then they were banned from using ChatGPT because then Samsung, you know, guys were worried that, you know, now OpenAI has access to their proprietary code. But I think on if you use mobile GPT, because we are actually using the API version of it, which is different from the web version, which is free, because we always get this question, but 
This thing is free on the web. Why are you charging people for it? The paid version on the API has complete privacy. So everything that you type in here is not going to be recorded by OpenAI or ourselves, as opposed to the free web version, which when you use everything you type in there actually gets recorded by, uh, by, 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 by OpenAI, which is what was a problem with the Samsung scenario because now OpenAI has access to their Samsung code. But if you use the mobile GPT, because we have a paid API, uh, it's a service that we pay for, so the information is completely private. So there's complete security. You can paste anything in here. Nobody is reading your information if you're worried about security and all of that. So, so far, I was just demoing the chat functionality of it. But uh, mobile GPT has much, much more than chat functionality. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to enter zero and, and reset the conversation. And then I'm going to just say hi so I can start from scratch so I can see the menu. What you can see, there's a menu. It's obviously we had challenges. How do you put a menu on a chat application on a, on a WhatsApp? But we figured eventually we got it right. So if you click here, you'll see the menu of all the things that you can do on chat GPT. So what we were doing now was just having a conversation, just asking it a question, and then it gives you an answer. But we have many, many, many more things we can do. So one of the interesting ones is generating images. So you can generate an image of almost anything and just ask it, please create me this image right now. And it will take just a couple of minutes and create that image. So I'm going to click uh, creating an image and then it gives you some pointers. Okay, give us the prompt for the image. And I've got some prompts here that I want to work with. So let me say, create a photo of a beach. I've just rework this prompt to be, there's a certain you know, thing with prompt engineering, which is a whole tutorial on its own, but there's a certain way to write prompts for the AI so that it understands exactly what it is that you want. You, you describe the type of image, like here I was very clear, I want a photorealistic image, which means it will create me an image which looks like a photograph, which looks like a real picture. Then you describe the thing that you want to create. And in my case, I wanted a serene beach with everything and there you go, it has created that image for me. If you click on it, this image is a new image created today, it doesn't exist anywhere on the internet, is just, uh, and if you resend the same prompt, you're gonna get a different image because every time it builds up that image from scratch. So you got a school assignment, you want some pictures you wanna make, you can use this. This you can also use in a professional setting for, um, for, you know, if you want to do like, you know, like presentations and you want specific images for your presentations, I actually use it to generate images for my reports in some cases that, uh, and, and, and you can see this is very, very high quality uh, image. I mean, you can try another, another, another image for the demo. Let me see here. This is an image of a person of a beautiful African woman. Let's try that. And so I'm going to go back to the menu and select, I want an AI image. And then it's going to go into what type of image you want. I'm going to put that in there. I want a photorealistic image again. And then you have here we've added this. You can add, I think I'll just go with a square image. And it just takes a couple of seconds and uh, feeds back to you what you said. But here I'll get an African woman wearing a superhero, Wonder Woman, Bad Woman outfit. And there you go. Um, so this is a an, an AI person. I think it's, you probably would have come across AI uh, images of you know people that have been you know, there was an AI image of the Pope with tattoos that was circulating for a while. It was generated with an AI tool like this, where you you know you can input another image and tell it to edit it for you and you know create deep fakes or whatever. But obviously, on mobile GPT we just have the generation functionality and ask it to you know what kind of image you want. And I'm going to go back to the main menu by just typing anything and then it responds with me. How can I help you? And then it shows me the menu. I would imagine for research purposes, you know, school information, live data is probably one of the things that gets used the most. And it's really amazing how we've done this. And this is something you won't get on the normal chat GPT, by the way, because the normal chat GPT doesn't have access to the internet right now. It's got data up to a certain, you know, uh, point in time. So I've got a prompt here. I wanted to, get to, to do some research for me. Uh, live data access to the internet. I want you to, I want you to just find, to, to get, generate me a report on 
the state of youth unemployment in South Africa. And I wanted to use um, live information. So it will go and it will, it's now searching the internet for live data. It actually, you can even see the date here, but this is 2014, but it has up to 2022, up to 2023 February, it will show you the date of the report. And then a little bit of a summary and a link, which means if you want, you can go into these individual pages and you know read about you know uh, the youth unemployment to to start your research journey but at the same time it actually goes and looks at the very high level summary of all of these things and it will generate a summary for you you know so as i was showing you that it, it also went and it created a report on the student of i mean the state of youth unemployment in south africa so it you know it generated a very high level report with some statistics you can read more and you know it's a long thing and obviously this will be difficult to read all of this on your whatsapp you know so we have an extra you know uh plus for you there is that you can say okay i want this report in word format there you go it just went and uh, created a word report for me microsoft word document which means i can just download it as a word report there and i'm just going to open it quickly and this report should be the state of youth unemployment in South Africa. There's a picture there as well. And you can read the statistics according to whatever reports. So imagine you were doing research and how long did it take us to do this research of youth unemployment uh, in South Africa? A few minutes. Obviously, there is some limitations, not even a few minutes, one minute. That's how long it took us to do the live data research. There is some limitations, of course, which I hope OpenAI will improve in the, in the future. One of the biggest ones in my mind is obviously you can see the size of the report is just like two pages and we can never get anything beyond that, mostly because um, it is limited by the number of tokens and there's, there's a lot that we can go into how the AI models work and the so and hopefully as they improve the AI models over time and we get more and more tokens we can put you know you can write an entire thesis with this because one other thing that, the next thing that you can do is you can go through all of these links one by one and you can get a report per link you know you can get a report per link and then you can combine it all together but at least if you were doing a research project this is a good place to start and instead of spending what at least two hours that would have, i would have spent on google to find all of this in two minutes i've got a nice summary report of um youth unemployment in south africa of course, there's still much more you can do with mobile GPT. I mean, I've covered so far, if I look at the menu, I think I've covered, let me just look at the menu again. I've covered conversations, AI images, website summary is the one where you can just paste that link, one of the links over there, and it will generate a summary report for you for that link. So then you can have you know, the high level summary report and the website summaries. And then the last one that I think I want to cover is just, let's say you wanted to do like, I don't know, I use this for like an AI document. Let's say I wanted to generate something like a letter of demand, right? Uh, I wanna generate a letter of demand that looks professional. And um, then it asks you, you know, what you wanna put in the letter of demand, um, the name of the whatever. So I, uh, my neighbor, my neighbor, Sinikiwe, Sinikiwe Hokong owes me, let's say i don't know um 4500 rand i gave her in 2000 and she has not she has not paid me back since then um the interest rate we agreed on was 10 percent per annum uh please also show the current date today is the 9th of you have to tell it um it doesn't know today's date the current date and date um i need this paid or i will be talking to my lawyers All right, so this is all the information I gave you. So imagine you needed to, to prepare a document and, and and by the way, I'm using a letter of demand here, but you know, most of the most common documents we get generated here is business plans, resumes, 
documents that are, you know, even an invoice, you know, you just have to type in there specifically what you want and the details of it. And you can just type it like the way I've done it here, like a person talking uh, in a very, very simple, you know, way. And then, yeah, it took just, I don't know, how long did it take since I typed this? You can, you know, gauge. And, and I'm going to just try and open this letter of demand here and see it. Did we download it? Is this the one? No, this is, there you go. Um, so it generated a letter and if you don't like it, you can always, you know, it put the, uh, you know, uh, how much you owe. So whatever I owed it, I told it I owed 4.5. I told it the year. It actually calculated for me the interest from that year until today to figure out that this much to now you owe me this much from the day, you know, so it also does math in the background, just like the way the chat GPT does math in the background. So, um, yeah, but definitely try it out on the free trial. You can, I think, in, create up to five different documents before it, you have, you know, but it, then again, like I said, it has, we have to, you know, somehow uh, provide the service and see, find a way to recover our funds. But so far, yeah, this is a demo. I, I don't know if there's any specific questions. Thank you, um, Bertha. This was amazing. I honestly never, ever get tired. I never get, like, my shock levels never reduce whenever I see the magic of ChatGPT. Like, I legit have given it a lot of information and said, can you put this in a table for me? Like, every time I do something like that, like, it completely blows my mind. So we are going to go straight over to a few questions right now. I'm just going to take some that's come through on the chat. Um, and then I also see a couple of hands. So let me just start with... Aslam has asked, great demo, how would teachers know if students are using ChatGPT when they need to do creative writing to thesis type tasks? What, uh, could AI plagiarism be a challenge? Um, currently, there is a couple of products on the market that can detect AI content or at least claim to generate to detect AI content, which I think you can use. I think even um, turn it in, which is one of the biggest, most commonly used um, plagiarism checkers online uh, uh, with universities and schools. Uh, it has an AI detector tool in there. But for me personally, knowing and understanding the technology, I can even tell you now that it, 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 those tools within a few months, they will be completely useless. The rate of AI development improvement is so vast that you would have to be developing these tools every other day because tomorrow there's GPT-5, which is completely different. And now you can even, I can even give it a sample of my own writing and say, this is my writing. Please write this report in this, with my writing style. And then you will not, we will, like no one will pick it up. So my point is people can try with the AI detector, but personally, I think it's, a, it, it's not going to be effective because the development in AI is just so significant and it's so quick that you would have to upgrade your detector every other day to just keep up with the technology. Then there's another question here. I think they, so there are a number of questions. I think some of them are repetitive of the same. I see another question here um, that's asking. So as I understand it, it searches and scrapes the entire internet for information. No validation of whether the information you get back is actually factually correct. This is from Sandy Lotz. Do you have any comments on this, um, Bertha? So um, the chip, chat GPT itself, the conversation version, the one which is the, the chat bot has been trained specifically for with information up to a certain point, I think it's 2021. Uh, that one, if you use that one, the information has been verified and it, there's even controls in place with things like, you know, you can't ask for, please write me a something, you know, like, I don't know, things that are like a porn novel or things like that, because there is controls in place where it will not return certain information. It will tell you, well, this content is, is we're not going to talk about this kind of things. Uh, you know, please help me, give me a formula for creating a bomb or whatever. You're not going to get those kind of information because there's controls in place to prevent that kind of uh, things. And it's been trained, which means that the engineers went through it and looked at what it gives you back. And then reinforced the learning so that it provides information that is accurate. There's other versions of chat models out there that are not as trained, but I would say ChatGPT is one of the best uh, well-trained uh, in the industry right now. 
compared to everything that exists because they spend a lot of time. That is why the cutoff is 2021 because they only trained it up to that point. So information after 2021 is not trained, but if you use a live data feature, uh, you get live data, then that is obviously just what's on the internet today. Then you have to gauge for yourself what you want to use and what you don't want to use. Yeah, I see there's still a number of questions here, um, Bertha. So there's one here from Nazneen uh, Lala. Can mobile GPT be linked to the CAPS curriculum, especially in the STEM subjects, STEM subjects? Yes, the short of it is yes, but it is a manual process. So it is not automatically linked. If you want something like that, you would have to get a developer like myself and say, well, Here's the curriculum, give me the data, and then we go build you your own custom chat GPT and train it on that data. And then that is would be the best tool, for example, to then give to the students because you could train them specifically on the curriculum that they're learning with the up-to-date information. Then you can even cut off the internet and say, I want you to just provide the information that is available in the data that I've trained you on. So that is 100% possible, but it's not automatically possible. You, there's a bit of extra development required to actually train the model on that data that you wanted to. And to add on to that, it means you can train it on anything. I could train it on the South African tax laws and make it a tax expert. I could train it on my MBA curriculum and make it an MBA lecturer. You know, I could train it on just about anything that I want. The background for the AI has been built. You would just have to feed the data you want to train it on and then you know, customize it a little bit and then you, you're good to go. There's another question here, Bertha, um, uh, also in the edu education sense from Boaz. Uh, given that ChatGPT can hallucinate, uh, have you built in any safeguards to guard against that, especially for learners that might not have might not have the capacity to question what they get? Okay, so if I was going to use ChatGPT in a learning environment, I would, um, you know, if, if you're going to prescribe it to students or, or whatever in that sense, I would go back to the previous question where I would custom train it on specific knowledge. So you can actually decide what knowledge it should be referring to when, it, when it's answering questions. So if I was going to use it in a school environment, I would want to custom train it on a curriculum. I would not use the internet version of it because internet version of it is open to the entire internet. But like I, as a, like I have mentioned earlier, there is safeguards built in place for, you know, just basic, you know, uh, you know, basic rules of, 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 of you know, of, of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and what it can and cannot do. So very high level rules of appropriateness uh, will be covered. Like, for example, I made the example with, you, you, if you ask it now, you know, can you please give me a formula for building a bomb, for example, it's not going to do that. It's going to tell you, well, I cannot do that. Uh, so very high level ap appropriateness is built it, into it. But if I wanted to use it in a school environment, I would want to do extra customization with the curriculum to make sure that it's going to actually follow the curriculum and not the generic internet information. Okay, I'm going to move over to some of the hands that are raised here. There's still a number of questions in the comment section. I'm just going to allow for some time um, for people that have raised their hands. Uh, is it Evan Alexander? Yeah, it's uh, Evan Alexander. Um, Beth, I just want to ask you, I see um, that there's a move towards regulating AI and there's a, sp a specific concern related to generative AI and I assume by that the concern is around being able to generate um, audio and visual images um, that are not the person itself but it's AI um, you know, posing as a person. Um, and I'm assuming in our current climate of, um, you know, cyber security issues that we're experiencing and, you know, all of those problems that we sit with daily, that this is the reason for this concern. How do you, how do you see this regulation impacting upon the AI industry? Um, I, I think regulation is, is is definitely a good a good way to go. But in my experience, I mean, I was there even with the cryptocurrency revolution. Is that technology often moves faster than the regulators can move their feet? Um, this is why people only realize when they see pictures of the Pope 
out there that have been uh, deep faked using AI that they realize actually we need to do something about this. So I, I, I commend, I think regulation is, is, is important, it's required, and I always you know, advocate for it. It just has to be balanced with innovation so that you know, regulation does not now become a problem for innovation or, you know, a stumbling block for people to be innovative because then the regulation stops people from building certain things. So I think it's, there's a balancing act, but it's required, but I don't see it actually stopping the move of technology. I know that, I'll give you an example, in Italy, they decided to ban ChatGPT completely because they were worried about the, the concerns while they think about they were worried about their privacy concerns while they were thinking about regulations, so they just banned it. And the very next day, VPN was the biggest, you know, search uh, search uh, thing on Google in Italy because people just found a way around it and used the VPN to, to still access it. So I think regulators have to think around how will they actually enforce even the regulations if they build it. Uh, but definitely, we need to 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 think around those kind of things. Thank you, Bertha. Um, I know, colleagues, there's still a couple of questions. I think for the sake of time, we're just going to close the questions there. I'm going to, Bertha, ask you to just hang in a few more minutes with us. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your energy, your motivational and absolutely inspiring story. Um, you know, uh, they say push you down seven times get up eight. And so I'm grateful. I'm glad that you persisted that to bring this technology to us, to um, the South African youth for the empowerment um, of their lives and knowledge. And so thank you so much for being with us today. Anissa, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Yintel. And thank you very much, Bertha. Love the energy. Really loved what it is that you shared and your story that got you there. Again, you know, the topic is, is so important right now because it's really on the tip of everyone's tongue. I mean, everyone, every social event you go to, people talk about chat GPT and whether it is someone that's in IT or non-IT, they find a way to make it part of their lived reality. So thank you for sharing that. And I, and I know that we will definitely have to look at how we invite you to come back because you're definitely a pioneer. Um, and there are lots of questions still in the chat. And if you do have the time, maybe you could think around some of those responses and either respond directly to the chat or send us some of the, the answers relating to, uh, to that. And thank you for also posting the number which people can use if they are interested. So, so colleagues, we've come to the end of the hour um, and we're not going to do the discussion activity that we had planned because we were so all engrossed in the passion of the discussion that, that Bertha gave us that we didn't want to stall, stall uh, or stop the, the conversation or stop the demo or not allow you the opportunity at least to lodge your questions. So we're going to end it there and we're not, we, in the, at a future session we will have some further discussion around chat GPT. But before I close and I hand to Evan who's going to do the close for us today, I just wanted to remind people around the survey that we are currently running in terms of innovation hour. Um, you know, Innovation Hour is good because of every one of you, every one of you that pitch up here on, on every second Friday to listen to the topics. Please do try and find five minutes in your day to complete the survey. One of the team will pop it into the chat. Um, and then those of you that have completed the survey, you can stay behind afterwards. We are going to do a kind of a draw to motivate the other people to also take part, but we'll do that after we've closed the meeting. Evan, over to you. Thank you very much. Evan, for stepping in for Hilton today. Yeah, thank you. So I'm standing in for our CIO who couldn't be here today. Um, but yeah, Bertha, I mean, wow, um, your courage, your perseverance, I mean, it's inspiring and so impressive. Um, I've learned so much today. Um, you know, we never think about how these things work when we use these tools that uh, innovators like yourself have created. Um, and I suppose just understanding the challenges that you've gone through to get to this point makes it all the more impressive. Um, the fact that you had to prove to Google and ChatGPT that you're a real developer, simply based on your background. Um, you know, it's so unfair, but so impressive that you've persevered to bring this tool to the market. Um, and I can I can clearly see the, the, the use case for this tool and how it will improve our access to information and data. And I think all of us um, have really enjoyed the session with you. Um, 
I'm not going to repeat. I've made notes of what you've said, but I'll use that for myself. I'm not going to repeat all of that here. We're right at the end of the session. But just to say to you once again, I mean, um, I am so impressed with what you've shared with us and what you've achieved so far. And I'd like to wish you all of the best um, with this um, application which you've developed. I'm certainly going to try it and um, well done and all the best for the future. And then also to Yentl, thank you very much um, for this really good session that you've um, hosted for us. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to Anissa and the team for setting up these regular innovation sessions. It's, uh, it's most useful and most informative. Thank you to all of you.